Okay, so it appears that the Supreme Court has handed down its decision now on Obamacare. And the bill, or the law, has been upheld. Now, um, it is obviously a bad thing. But it's also a good thing in a way, I think. Here's why. I think it helps destroy this idea that governments can be constrained by constitutions. I think this buries the idea of limited government, pretty much. I mean, for anybody who has half a brain, who's capable of you know, sustaining a, a rational thought, for at least a few seconds, this should be ample demonstration that uh, governments will find a way around any written document that purports to purports to constrain their power. So I was just I was just looking at a video by Reason TV where their analyst. Uh, was giving his viewpoint saying that, oh, you know, yeah, obviously it's a bad thing, but it's a good thing because at least they didn't push it through under the Commerce Clause. So the Commerce Clause, I'm sure most of my subscribers know this, but, you know, the Commerce Clause is the, is the uh, reference in the Constitution to the Congress's ability to, inter to regulate interstate commerce, whatever that means. What does it mean to regulate, make regular, what is regular, and so forth. You know, and, and lots of ridiculous decisions have been... Um, uh, uh, rendered by the Supreme Court citing the Commerce Clause. For example, um, uh, in the 30s during the New Deal uh, debacle, one farmer grew some wheat on his farm, and I, you know, I can't, you know, you can find this online. So forgive me for not giving you a link with like the actual, you know, case information. But the farmer basically what happened was he, he grew some wheat on his farm for his own consumption. For his livestock and himself, um, and uh, he was fined or something for whatever. Anyway, so he, he took the, the he took it to court and uh, because he resisted being fined, he took it to court. It made all the way um, uh, uh, made it all the way to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court said, "Well, yeah, he wasn't participating in any interstate commerce because he was just growing wheat basically on his own land for his own consumption. But because he consumed his own wheat, that means that he didn't buy." wheat from somebody else and that affected interstate commerce which you know we understand that anything can affect anything like you can you can construct an argument that any action uh, affects anything you know anything else whatever you want to put in the argument you can actually you know present a plausible argument that there's there's some effect of what you do or don't do on whatever so, so yeah but back to commerce clause in the supreme court and the reason tv reason tv thought that that was a good thing that they couldn't, uh, um, the argument of the government for the law uh, was made under the Commerce Clause. The decision rendered by the Supreme Court was actually quite unexpected because they didn't use the Commerce Claw, Clause to, uh, Commerce Claw, nice. Um, they didn't use the Commerce Clause to justify the law, rather they used the power to tax that, Congre that the Congress uh, obviously has to justify the law. Now. Again, the interesting legal kind of quirk in, in this is that uh, the government has specifically argued that this is not a tax, that the penalty for not buying health insurance is not a tax. In fact, um, you know, it is my understanding that uh, it may have been worded uh, differently in the beginning, but they changed the language of the law as, well, as it was being deliberated uh, in Congress to specifically avoid uh, positioning it as a tax. Well, the, the Supreme Court decision actually says, well, it's a tax. It's a tax, and you can get exempted from the tax, right? You can get tax-exempt status from this particular tax by buying a certain product from a private company. Very interesting. Um, well, my question to Reason TV would be, are you fucking insane? So what good does it do me that, yeah, they can't force me, according to you, they can't force me uh, to do X under Commerce Clause. Okay, nice, great, um, yay for us. They can't force us. Well, but they can't force you to do the same thing under their power to tax. What difference does it make to me? Like, what's to stop them from coming up with something else they want me to do? And then taxing me for not doing it. Like, you know, coming up with a tax and, and call it XYZ tax. And then, but you can get exemption from XYZ tax by doing action ABC over there. Like buying a product or dressing in black or whatever. You know, the, I'm not aware of any legal 
technical restrictions on the government uh, um, in terms of what they can and cannot tax. They can tax incomes, they can tax certain products, right? Uh, excise taxes, they tax imports tariffs, right? They, they tax pretty much any, anywhere where there's, uh, you know, money changing hands, they can tax. So what's, how is that not a perfect instrument for forcing behavior? If we're talking about economic behavior, say for example, dressing in black, you know, you can construe that as an economic behavior because in order to dress in black, you have to buy black, right? There's all sorts of very interesting implications, but I'm just I'm I'm just laughing at uh, reason for saying, oh, it's great news because it wasn't done in the commerce clause because at least the commerce clause now has limits. Oh, <laughs> whoop de doo, oh jeez, it's just, I I think it's just ridiculous. So again, my position is this is great. Because this discredits the idea of limited government. This, this sh at least it should, the government will not be constrained, okay? Because ultimately, the relationship between the people and the government is one-sided. We can't opt out from this relationship. We have no way of opting out. They have a power that's legitimate, unfortunately, in the eyes of most of the population, they have the power to basically force us to do stuff, even if we don't want to. And just because there's a piece of paper that says, oh, you're not supposed to do X, Y, Z, X, Y, and Z, well, they find their way around the X, Y, and the Z, um, as they ha always have. And when it's, you know, when, when constructing a legal argument is either, uh, you know, taking too long or inconvenient or whatever, they just, they just you know, suspend the Constitution like Lincoln did or, you know, uh, citing emergencies and stuff. Uh, emergencies are, are, are actually very, very useful in that. So, you know, the idea that um, having a written constitution or having some sort of, you know, codified set of constraints will actually succeed in constraining and limiting government is ludicrous. The track record that this idea has had is not too great. And today, I think, is a day of vindication for those of us who insist that government as such, based on the logic of human action, can be limited.